Good evening and uh, welcome to the Kogut Institute for the Humanities at Brown and to our spring Meet the Fellows event, which we're very excited to be presenting. I'm Amanda Anderson, the director of the Institute, and it is my great pleasure to be the host for this event, which will showcase the research of our annual fellows through a series of speed talks. I would like to first extend a warm welcome to all of those in attendance, including Brown University students, local and remote, faculty members, Brown alumni, community members, and curious onlookers near and afar. We're very delighted to have all of you here joining us this evening. The Kogut Institute at Brown serves as a humanities hub featuring dynamic programming and research initiatives and advancing new collaborative models of cross-disciplinary teaching linked to some of the most challenging issues facing scholars and citizens, such as global climate change, crises of democracy, and the persistent problems of systemic racism. At the core of the Institute is the Fellows Seminar, where each year's group of fellows gather weekly to pursue research projects. These annual fellows include faculty, undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows. We typically have about 20 to 25. Bringing together scholars from different stages of career around one seminar table, or more recently, Zoom room, is one of the most generative and unusual aspects of our fellowship community. And we are relatively unique, moreover, a trendsetter, I would say, in our inclusion of undergraduate fellows. Another distinctive feature is the impressive cohort of postdoctoral fellows, eight each year, jointly housed in academic departments in the Institute. Postdocs add enormously to the life of the Institute, bringing cutting edge research to the fellow seminar and to their teaching within departments. I wanna thank the entire Kogut Institute team, as well as Brown's amazing media services department for helping us to bring this event to you. The pandemic has prompted some creative thinking around formats, and we have been happy this year to introduce these new virtual speed talks. We had a first session at the beginning of the fall where the other half uh, of our fellows spoke. And um, if you're interested, you can find the video on our website's video archive. I'll say a little bit more about our upcoming programming at the end of tonight's session, just a few things. I won't go on and on, but um, I do hope that you can um, stay after the end to just hear what we're planning in the next couple of uh, months. So here's how we're gonna proceed. I will introduce the fellows two at a time and the talks will proceed in pairs of two without interruption. We've made an effort to pair talks that have some sort of connection to each other and I invite you to be thinking about how the various talks speak to each other. So our first speaker this evening will be Jennifer Johnson, Associate Professor of History at Brown, where she's also affiliated with the Center for Middle East Studies, Africana Studies, and the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Uh, you will note, notice a pattern that many of our fellows have multiple, in fact, dizzying numbers of associations and affiliations. Her research focuses on 20th century Africa, specifically the Maghreb, and on nationalism, decolonization, humanitarianism, and public health. She holds an AB in history from Brown and received her doctorate in history from Princeton. Our second speaker, Aviva Cormier, is a postdoctoral fellow in international humanities with the Department of Anthropology, where she teaches courses in social bioarchaeology and biological anthropology, with a special emphasis on the bioarchaeology of disability. And don't worry, she will explain what that means. She earned her MA and PhD in archaeology from Boston University. Please enjoy these first two talks. Hi, good evening. My name is Jennifer Johnson, and as Amanda mentioned, I'm a faculty member in the history department 
thank you to her and to the entire COGIT team and media services for putting this event together. While I'm a COGIT fellow, I'll be working on my book manuscript entitled State Building After Empire, Healthcare, Family Planning, and International Aid in North Africa. This project examines the origins and expansion of family planning programs in Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria from the 1960s to the 1980s. It examines how and why these North African countries, all former French colonies, entered into voluntary partnerships with international organizations after decolonization, and explains the outcomes newly sovereign leaders hoped to achieve it shows how they forge strategic alliances, albeit with varying levels of commitment with the Population Council and the Ford Foundation, and later with USAID, the World Bank, and the World Health Organization, in an effort to secure vital international aid, including financial, material, and intellectual resources that would support their efforts to develop a more robust healthcare infrastructure after the end of empire. The book makes several important contributions to a variety of fields, including African history, Middle Eastern history, French imperial studies, histories of decolonization, global health, and gender and sexuality studies. First, the new research builds upon the framework of my first book, The Battle for Algeria, Sovereignty, Healthcare, and Humanitarianism, and examines the role of medicine and healthcare in the process of post-colonial state building. It once again challenges the familiar and still dominant accounts of decolonization that emphasize political and economic factors over social policy, particularly health and welfare. State building after empire situates family planning as the core health policy to be interrogated and returns to my fundamental methodology of using the prism of medicine and health to illuminate the ways North Africans shaped their new national institutions and navigated their place on the world stage. Second, the project offers a new interpretation of family planning and global health programs. The existing literature emphasizes how family planning programs acted as a colonial or neo-colonial enterprise with the pernicious goal of reducing the number of black and brown people. In contrast, my study prioritizes the politics of the newly independent state and demonstrates that its leaders were active agents in the decision and implementation process. Leaders across North Africa defined their own healthcare priorities and developed creative strategies to secure vital resources. In their pursuit to develop national healthcare infrastructure, these North African figures engaged in a mutual partnership with international organizations one in which both sides formulated policies derived from a shared language and understanding of development, governance, and political expectation. Therefore, this study demonstrates how newly independent countries in the global south shape both the actions of international organizations and global health discourse. Finally, state building after empire places gender and sexuality at the center of the post-colonial project. It showcases how women, their bodies and their reproductive choices were central to domestic and international policies. On the one hand, state leaders understood that all citizens, men and women, required access to health and medical services if the nation was to thrive after the end of empire. However, the women themselves were often foils to larger political aims. Given that family planning was a global health priority, North African leaders elevated the promotion and care of women and later children to marshal material resources. Despite the broader state and international ambitions, women who encountered new reproductive technologies and came into contact with international health experts acquired new information and materials, enabling them to exert more control over their lives. I look forward to engaging these themes and the work of my colleagues this semester in the seminar. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for taking the time to be here tonight. As Amanda mentioned, my name is Aviva Cormier, and I am finishing up my last semester at Brown as a postdoctoral fellow with the Department of Anthropology and the Koga Institute. I received my doctorate from Boston University and came to Brown from the Smithsonian, where I was an osteologist with the repatriation office at the National Museum of Natural History. I am a bioarchaeologist, as Amanda mentioned, and I examine human culture, behavior, and society through human skeletal remains and their archaeological 
or historical context. In particular, I study individuals with physical differences. So those whose bodies do not conform to our notions of a normal body or to the normal of that particular society in question. And I explore the lived experiences of these individuals, how they might have navigated their physical and social environments and how they might have self-identified or been identified by their community. I look at how these individuals might have navigated the social construction of disability in their sociocultural context and what we can then learn about the intersections between individual experiences, disability, and culture today. My current research project centers on reframing how bioarchaeologists define and conceptualize disease. Instead of solving the mystery of what might have afflicted an individual in the past, my research shifts the attention from the disease at work to the person who once lived and breathed. And by rethinking how we engage with disease in the past, we can shed light on the life ways of people and how they lived with disease, rather than caring only about that identification of the disease. And with this new focus, we can uncover universal and longstanding experiences of disease and disability, highlighting how everyone and anyone experiences at least momentary limitations during their lives and thus effectively humanize modern marginalized communities. I have created a methodological framework, which is currently in press in the International Journal of Paleopathology, thanks in large part to the feedback from the fellows during our seminar. And in that article, I present a workflow for researchers to follow in order to step beyond that puzzle of the disease towards an understanding of the individual's experiences throughout their life course. It emphasizes how an individual's physical and social activity limitations might change over time and how cultural perceptions and identities are continually in flux. For example, an individual with skeletal differences in the spinal column might experience impingement on their spinal cord and this might cause physical and neurological limitations which could increase during their lifetime resulting in various activity limitations. They might not be able to fulfill their role in their community, let alone accomplish basic human tasks like feeding themselves or walking for periods of time. We can then incorporate what we know about that culture from the archeological or historical records to consider how that person might have identified and how they might have been treated in their community. And perhaps most importantly, my framework also integrates considerations of the modern rare disease health movement, allowing us to further consider the impact of disease on life experiences, advance contemporary perspectives on impairment and disability, and raise awareness about rare diseases in the past and today. Bioarchaeologists and archeologists in general have a responsibility not only to those we study, and their descendants and other stakeholders, but to contribute directly to that rare disease community, using what we learn about the past to provide essential insight on the possibilities in the future. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for those two timely and um, inspiring and thought-provoking talks, uh, both of which engage issues of renewed importance during the current public health crisis which has focused much needed attention to speak to Jennifer's talk on the role of the state in public health challenges and to speak to Aviva's talk on the lived experience of people with disabilities. Our next speaker will be undergraduate fellow Karis Rue, who is double concentrating in history and East Asian studies. Her project wonderfully combines her own personal history with questions relating to US military history and memory studies. Karis will be followed by graduate student fellow Greg Hitch. Greg is a fifth year doctoral candidate in American studies, working at the intersection of environmental history, 
critical environmental justice and indigenous studies. We will begin with Karis. Hello, thank you all for being here. My name is Karis Ryu and I am an undergraduate fellow studying history and East Asian studies. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of the Kogut Institute this year and for the support of the cohort and the Institute in conducting my senior honors thesis in history. My thesis is called A New Park, A Lost Town, defining the legacy of U.S. Army Garrison Yongsan. Yongsan Garrison is the oldest U.S. Army installation in South Korea, with the U.S. military coming into the territory that was once occupied by the Japanese colonial government following World War II. It is a significant symbol for South Korean citizens and American military affiliated residents alike, and imbued with multiple complex meanings and legacies of cooperation and of pain. Negotiations have been conducted over the past 20 years to return the garrison land to the South Korean government, which will form from it a Korean national park. In 2019, an accelerated return process of Yongsan Garrison was greenlit to begin. To provide personal context, my father is a U.S. Army chaplain, and both my parents are first-generation Korean immigrants to the United States. I grew up as an amalgamation of Korean-American and U.S. Army brat experiences, and one of the many moves we made as a family was to the U.S. Army garrisons in South Korea. As a graduate of Seoul American High School on Yongsan Garrison, who lived on the base from 2016 to 2017, I am personally invested in making this complex history known. I currently structure my work through, through two particular threads of thought. First, I take the thesis through Korean perspectives on Yongsan Park formation as a way to revive and restore Korean culture, then perspectives of Yongsan garrison residents who mourn the loss of what has come to be their home, and then current projects and methods that are being conducted to promote coexistence and mutual understanding. The second thread takes the discussion from physical to virtual planes. Amidst ongoing debates about how to properly use and commemorate the physical land of the base, proposals for virtual archives have arisen as viable ways to preserve people's memories. I rely on a diverse range of primary and secondary sources to make this argument. In particular, I am excited to analyze pieces of a large 800 plus photo archive put together by former students of Seoul American High School from the 1970s and 1980s and the integrative virtual memory archive called the Yongsan Legacy Project, which is being contributed to by Korean and American perspectives alike. So I would like to take a moment and just share a few of the um, photos that I will be using for my thesis. Um, so the one on the left is of the Yongsan Garrison Teen Club during the 1970s taken by a prolific student photographer named George May. Um, and on the outside, these are Quonset huts, which are military structures. But on the inside, this is where teenagers would spend their afternoons and their weekends. Um, there, is, there would be a jazz club in there, and there were formative memories being made. And then on the right, this is the Seoul American High School junior class in 1979, doing their powder puff football game, which is when uh, female students would play football and their male classmates would then um, cheer and take on cheerleading uniforms. And this was happening on the football field by the high school on the base. And this is the cover page of yongsanlegacy.org, which uh, you can look up online if you're interested. And it's designed to be a virtual memorial that spans the spectrum of G's, GIs and civilians and all of their experiences um, that are affiliated with this place. So ultimately, my project desires is to illuminate the complex past of Yongsan Garrison explore the actions of multiple parties throughout the transferal process, and argue for future actions that can be taken to encourage compassionate education and harmony. Thank you for listening. Hello, uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you to everyone who put together this event. Uh, my name is Gregory Hitch and I'm a PhD candidate in American Studies. And I will talk briefly today about my dissertation titled The Forest Keepers and Environmental History of the Menominee Nation from colonization to climate change. So the Menominee Reservation is home to the last old growth forest in what is now the state of Wisconsin. So a major question animating this research is how did the Menominee preserve this forest from clear cutting? Uh, like many histories, the answer is not tidy or clear, uh, but one thing that consistently stands out is that the Menominee always put their community first. 
both human and more than human. Indeed, many Menominees understand forest beings like trees, grasses, soils, and such to hold energy, uh, have agency, and as relatives. So this kinship has guided many Menominee decisions for generations, both before colonization as well as today. <clears throat> So my dissertation explores Menominee survival, adaptation, and resurgence through their struggles against the American settler colonial state from 1815 to the present. Uh, across these decades, the Menominee experienced a catastrophic earth systems change precipitated by forced treaties that allowed settlers to violently appropriate nearly all the land and terraform it by damming rivers, clear cutting forests, and plowing under prairies to extract the energy contained in these ecosystems. Uh, the nascent field of energy humanities has made important strides in understanding how societies and cultures are entangled with fossil fueled energy systems. However, I would argue that few of these scholars have focused on the energy flowing through ecosystems, and fewer still have also centered indigenous ways of knowing the world. As a result, most studies tend to ignore the long history of indigenous communities' relationships with, the more, with more than human beings that constitute the energies flowing through these ecosystems and thereby treat land as merely a, a surface upon which Western history plays out. So without a material discursive analysis of settler society's violent seizure of land to capture these ecological energies, uh, we discount the environmental injustices indigenous peoples experience materially through curtailed access to ancestral foods, medicines, and fuels, but also culturally through disrupted life ways, spiritualities, and knowledge systems bound up in these materials and spaces. So my project fills this gap by investigating the impacts of American settler colonialism as an act of environmental injustice, while also illuminating the Menominee's persistence and adaptive capacity to fight this ecological colonization. Indeed, I argue that the Menominee consistently adapted to and resisted colonization by utilizing their ancestral knowledge systems, organizing principles and interspecies ethical frameworks. So by insisting on the agency, relationality and ethical treatment of their forest relatives, the Menominee saved the land from massive clear cutting and now practice world renowned sustainable forestry, are deploying renewable energy and investing in culturally relevant regenerative agriculture. Finally, I believe this research is especially critical since most scholars investigating environmental justice and climate change focus on the extraction, burning and waste products of fossil fuels. However, a sizable percentage of greenhouse gas emissions, some estimates put it at 25%, are associated with mass deforestation, industrial agriculture, and the damming of rivers. These emissions and impacts, moreover, will probably be the hardest to reduce if we stand a chance to reverse climate change. However, by reforesting land, farming regeneratively, and restoring ecosystems, we can biosequester huge amounts of carbon in the soil instead of releasing it into the atmosphere. That is why historically grounded studies of, the, of energy systems outside of fossil fuels are critical for offering lessons in how to ethically draw down carbon and build a better world. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Karas and Greg, for those talks, um, both of which manifest an extraordinary commitment to understanding the lived experiences of the people you're studying, um, but also just to have an extraordinary commitment to the ideals that that animate your work. And it's just really wonderful to see. Our next talk will continue the theme of environmental studies. David Frank is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Philosophy and the Cogat Institute. He earned his PhD in philosophy at the University of Texas in 2012 with a dissertation on philosophy of conservation biology. He has since held postdoctoral positions at NYU the University of North Carolina, and the University of Tennessee, developing research collaborations with environmental scientists and teaching courses on environmental ethics, research ethics, and the philosophy of science. He will be followed by graduate student fellow Kelly Huynh, a sixth year doctoral student in the Department of Classics. Kelly is pursuing an innovative dissertation exploring how 19th and 20th century Vietnamese political and intellectual leaders used their classical education to negotiate their changing identities and create spaces for themselves within their colonial reality. We will first turn to David. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks to the staff and everyone for putting this together. Um, as Amanda said, I'm David Frank. I'm a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in philosophy in the Kogan Institute. 
My research and teaching in environmental philosophy focus on ethics and values in environmental sciences, especially in conservation biology and ecology, environmental health research, and environmental economics. Um, most of my philosophical work has involved showing how values and ethical debates are embedded within these environmental sciences. And I'm currently interested in science and values controversies about invasive species, economic growth, and environmental health research ethics. And for the next couple of minutes, I'll use invasive species as an example to bring out some of the questions I think about in my research. So you might be asking yourself, what is an invasive species? So ecologists, conservation biologists, and specialist invasion biologists often define invasive species as biogeographically non-native species introduced by humans that establish populations, grow, and spread particularly quickly, their populations having significant impacts on the recipient ecosystem. In other contexts, especially for conservation and biosecurity policy, invasive species has a more explicitly value-laden definition as introduced or non-native species that are likely to cause harm to humans or the environment. Classic examples here include weeds like kudzu, pests like the cane toad, pathogens like chestnut blight, and introduced predators like cats or pythons. But these definitions raise many questions in environmental philosophy and environmental ethics. Firstly, why does biogeographic origin or where a species initially evolved matter? What values are presupposed when conservation biologists take biogeographic origin or anthropogenic or human caused dispersal to be important? Some scholars have argued that conservation biologists preference for native species implies a kind of xenophobia or that it reflects an outdated and culturally specific ideal of untouched pristine nature or wilderness. Others have argued that the military metaphor of invasion is too resonant with social xenophobia and social nativism to be ethically responsible. Relatedly, others argue that in the context of global anthropogenic environmental change, the very idea of native species is becoming increasingly dubious and it is potential ecological impacts that are important in thinking through questions in conservation and ecosystem management, not where species came from. Others defend the relevance of biogeographic origin arguing that native species ought to be protected because of the value of ecological diversity and that the introduction of non-native species is risky for evolutionary, ecological, and other reasons. Secondly, how do we define environmental harm? In the case of harms to say human agriculture, human health, it's relatively easy. Feral hogs, for example, reportedly cause more than a billion dollars of damage annually to US agriculture and threaten habitat for several federally listed endangered species. But other cases are far less clear. Skeptics of invasion biology often point to ecosystem services performed by introduced species, even some that are considered damaging invaders. The question of environmental harm raises all of the classic issues in environmental ethics. Harm to who? Harm to what? Can an ecosystem itself literally be damaged or unhealthy due to introduced species? Or is this a metaphor for some other kind of harm? If protection of native species is important to conserve ecological diversity, as increasing movement of species across biogeographic areas decreases the differences between ecosystems, why is ecological diversity important? Finally, how should invasive species be managed ethically, if at all? How should conflicts between populations of sentient vertebrates like feral hogs and the broader environment be resolved and who should be involved in making these decisions? Do novel biotechnologies offer solutions to invasive species management issues or are these too risky or otherwise ethically problematic? In my research, I explore various answers to these questions attending to both scientific and ethical arguments, looking to illuminate how these are intertwined. I aim to produce philosophical research that will engage broader communities across disciplines and connect the two cultures of the sciences and the humanities. Thank you all for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Wing, and I am a PhD candidate in ancient history in the Department of Classics. I am a refugee from Vietnam, a first generation high school and college grad, and I am also slated to be the first woman to receive a doctorate degree from the ancient history program here at Brown University. 
Today, I would like to share with you how I came to my dissertation project. I was exasperated from having classicists, upon finding out that I am Vietnamese, ask me whether or not I had read Jonathan Shea's Achilles in Vietnam, an infamous study in the field of classical reception that demonstrates the utility of ancient Greek literature, especially the Homeric Iliad, in processing the war trauma of American combat veterans from the Vietnam War. Yes, I had read it, or rather struggled through it, as I had to brace myself for every racial slur that popped up in the veterans' accounts of the Vietnam War. Shea's work was problematic to me in a way that other classicists did not seem to notice. While Shea's study centers the experiences of American veterans of the Vietnam War, elevating their trauma to the register of Greek mythology, it relegates Vietnamese people to the margins of history, either victimizing or demonizing them. The index of Achilles in Vietnam is telling enough of how Vietnamese people are actively disremembered in his work and more broadly within the American imagination. Vietnamese does not appear as a standalone gloss. In its place is Viet Cong, with the additional gloss, see enemy Vietnamese. What is even more disturbing is the fact that Shea's work has inspired a whole subfield of classical reception that privileges the American experience to the detriment of the Vietnamese. As I began to notice the active disremembering of Vietnamese people within the field of classics, my exasperation evolved into a desire to ethically remember Vietnamese people, even or perhaps especially within a field such as classics, a field that has not only historically been Western centric, but has also been used to sanction violent societal structures, such as racism and imperialism. Why has Vietnam not appeared in classics except as a metonym for the Vietnam War? This was especially baffling to me since Vietnamese is one of the few Asian languages whose national written script has officially been Romanized. On top of that, the French Empire colonized Vietnam under the belief that they had inherited the Roman Empire and were tasked with the duty of spreading Latin civilization to more inferior cultures. Vietnam also serves as a particularly illuminating case study due to the fact that while French colonial administrators applied a blank slate approach to subjugate other territories in Vietnam, they had to reckon with the legacies of the Chinese empire, complete with its own classical canon that were so deeply embedded in Vietnamese society. In my dissertation, therefore, I had investigate the overlooked history of the Greco-Roman classical tradition in Vietnam and its entanglement with Western imperialism from the French colonial era in the mid 19th century to the present post-colonial moment. I show the ways in which the French and American empires have racialized Greco-Roman antiquity to construct myths of themselves and of the Vietnamese to authorize their imperial projects. I argue that Vietnamese people have in turn reworked Greek and Roman literature to challenge these myths about themselves that range from the ideal colonized people to the good refugee. So for example, I analyze how the contemporary Vietnamese American writer Ocean Vuong engages with the Homeric Odyssey in his poetry collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds. Instead of a traditional nostos, Vung's Odysseus returns home dead. Meanwhile, Vung's Telemachus struggles to understand what traits, memories, and legacies he inherits from his father as he embarks on his journey to self-discovery as a young queer man. By killing Odysseus and inverting his fate in his poems, Vung asks what would happen to Telemachus had Odysseus not returned home from war? Would Telemachus have had to flee from Ithaca and become a refugee? Would Odysseus' story have been preserved? And if so, how, where, and by whom? Would the traditions of masculinity hold up in the face of displacement? I argue that Vung disrupts the mythological narrative in order to explore the conflicting layers of his intergenerational trauma and to insert his post-war transnational perspective into the Western memory of Vietnam in its infamous war and ultimately to challenge historical erasure. Throughout my dissertation, I analyzed the tension between the perceived value and the real threats of classic or Vietnamese communities in and beyond Vietnam. And I contend that Vietnamese communities, both national and diasporic, have used the classical tradition as a means for imperial critique. Thank you all for attending this event and thank you to those who made this event possible. And thank you to the Koga Institute for providing me with the space and community to pursue this research. Thank you uh, for those gripping uh, talks, David and Kelly. Um, you know, and I think both of them really productively 
challenge the limits of common disciplinary thinking, which is something that, you know, we see the space of the Kogan Institute as helping to enable. I mean, in the case of David, I think it's absolutely critical, um, the work that he's doing to forge dialogues between scientists and humanities scholars, um, sort of at the start, not sort of after one has done scientific research to say, hmm, I wonder how we might bring ethics into this. Um, and in Kelly's case, I just think she's doing extraordinary work in pushing on the boundaries of uh, traditional classical research and um, yeah, and, and really kind of rethinking what's possible as a project within classics. We will next hear from two of our postdoctoral fellows. Jessica Stair is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow affiliated with the Department of History of Art and Architecture, uh, also affiliated with the Center for the Study of the Early Modern World and the Kogut Institute. She earned her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and her research focuses on indigenous artistic and scribal practices of colonial Mexico. Gustavo Quintero is a postdoctoral fellow in international humanities with the Department of Hispanic Studies, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and the Kogut Institute. He teaches courses in Mexican literature and theory with a focus on border issues. He received his PhD in Romance Studies from Cornell University, and his research examines the cultural legacies of revolutionary processes in the Caribbean, Colombia, and Mexico, Mexico, including its two borders. Jessica will start us off. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Stair, and I am a postdoctoral fellow teaching in the Department of History of Art and Architecture. And I specialize in the art and visual culture of colonial Latin America. In particular, my research focuses on indigenous artistic and scribal practices of central Mexico. And primarily, I'm interested in the relationship of images to textual forms, the mobilization of pictures to assert the identity and authority of their creators and beholders, and the ways in which artistic conventions and traditions changed over time. I'm presently working on a book manuscript based on my dissertation, which considers late colonial artistic and scribal practices in a corpus of Nahuatl language documents known as the Techialoyans. I conduct a comparative analysis across a corpus of 41 documents to consider how late colonial artists and scribes invented new iconographies and modes of reading and writing that derived from pre-Columbian, early colonial and European traditions. I consider literacy as a culturally determined phenomenon and argue that pictures, oral traditions, performance, and alphabetic script constitute a kind of indigenous literacy of the later colonial period. Artists and scribes relied upon these conventions to defend rights to land and status, as well as preserve ways of life. This work is significant because it reveals the ways in which indigenous communities of the later colonial period still relied on pictures and other artistic and scribal traditions at a time when alphabetic script had become a predominant mode of conveying information. My paper for the Kogut seminar focuses specifically on discourses of authenticity that surround the Techialoyans. Because of their preponderance of pictures and inclusion of archaizing linguistic and material forms, the manuscripts have posed historiographical problems since they first came to scholarly light in the early 20th century. Initially thought to have been created in the 16th century, they were later found to have been products of the late colonial period, very likely created in association with an individual who was accused of producing false land titles for indigenous communities. While it is not certain that the Techialoyans were created to deceive viceregal authorities or make money, a cloud of suspicion regarding their authentic status continues to hang over them. Instead of laboring over the unanswerable question of whether or not the manuscripts were artful schemes, it is more productive to examine the manuscripts themselves and the social, political, and cultural contexts in which they circulated. My question is not to ask if they are genuine or not, but rather to consider the interpretive acts that made them authentic or not to various audiences who engaged with them in the 17th and 18th centuries and even today. 
The manuscripts themselves and their pictorial, alphabetic, linguistic, and material composition held value for the communities who acquired them. By considering the formal and material aspects of the Tetiolians with their innovative iconographies, archaizing linguistic forms, and evocations of oral discourses and embodied practices, we gain valuable insights into indigenous forms of expression and articulations of the past in the late colonial period. Instead of viewing the Tetiolians as mere fabrications, I argue that they transform earlier traditions to invent new forms that authenticated the lived ritual practices of validating territorial claims in colonial Mexico while boosting the status of indigenous communities. I, I'm looking forward to discussing these ideas with the other fellows in the seminar this spring. Thank you. Hello all. My name is Gustavo Quintero, and I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Cogot Institute, the Department of Hispanic Studies and the Center of Latin American and Caribbean Studies. My research is concerned with the aftermath of revolutions in Latin America, but it focuses on a pressing question, how to maintain a sense of hope during dire times. My book argues that to revisit Latin American revolution entails an analysis of aesthetic products and how this played a decisive role in delineating and spreading a sense of hope related to collective upheavals. I read a number of novels, photographs, and experimental videos from three regions, Cuba, Colombia, and Mexico. And I explore how these created an image of the future as a realm of action and possibility. For instance, in Mexico, I focus on the photographs by Juan Rulfo, one of the most important writers in Latin America. His photographs on railroad are, are um, understudied, and yet they show a conception of the Mexican revolution in terms of progress. I argue that they show how trains created a social perception of time based on transportation, connectivity, and migration. Allow me to share with you some of those photographs. Rulf photographer displays of an alternate version of revolutionary dreams, those of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, as a political organization that appropriated the collective uprising of the Mexican Revolution in order to remain in power for more than 70 years. So here in these photographs, Rufo presents the modernization of this institutionalized revolution. We have here the railroads that would delimit a certain sense of time and of duration, and also a circulation of people that would cr create the basis of Mexican politics till 2000. So how does Rulfo present the dreams of modernization of this institutionalized revolution here? What kind of vision for the future do these photographs reveal through their focus on trains? What hopes about revolutionary times and mobilities do these images show? These are the questions that I explore in my research. Thank you so much. Thanks for those two brilliant discussions centered on the complex histories and cultural practices of Latin America. And now our two final talks. First, we will hear from Jennifer Lamb Associate Professor of Latin American and Caribbean History. Her work explores the intersection between political history, intellectual history, and popular culture in Cuba and the Americas more broadly. She has also written on the history of mental illness in Cuba, as well as the transnational history of psychiatric dehospitalization. And last, but certainly not least, we will hear from undergraduate fellow, Matthew, Marciello, an undergraduate double concentrating in American studies and gender and sexuality studies. He is working on a thesis exploring US intersex history. I hope you enjoy these last two talks and can stay just a moment afterward to hear more about our upcoming programming. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I'll just echo everybody's thanks to the COGET for making this opportunity possible. 
Um, as Amanda mentioned, my name is Jennifer Lamb and I'm in the Department of History here at Brown. I teach on Latin American and Caribbean history, the history of psychiatry and popular culture. And I just have to say how exciting it is to see two of my former undergraduate students among tonight's presenters. Um, looking forward to spending the semester with them as well. So um, my first book, Madhouse, Psychiatry and Politics in Cuban History, um, very much is exploring that intersection that Amanda highlighted between political history, intellectual history, and popular culture. And that's the topic of my current book project, uh, which is currently titled The Subject of Revolution Between Political and Popular Culture in Cuba. The book explores knowledge production in and about the Cuban Revolution, and specifically that relationship between what we might call high politics or political culture and popular culture. I'm interested in how understandings of the revolution were consolidated during its first three decades, both from above and from below, as we historians like to say. The book argues that that subject of revolution here um, in both of its kind of significations represents the synthesis of the imaginaries constructed by its many subjects, including revolutionary leaders, of course, professionals from a variety of disciplines, um, but most importantly, I, I think ordinary people. So I'm particularly interested here in the question of mediation. So traditional media outlets, radio, television, the press, but also the ways in which revolution itself, in Cuba always capital R, revolution, came to bear a self-evident meaning to people all over the world, how it could be both obvious and ineffable um, to so many people at the same time. So the book follows three courses or three principal axes of mediation, revolution as a political enterprise, as a scholarly problematic, uh, and most importantly, as an experiential framework. So just to give you a sense of some of the things um, I'm trying to get at here, uh, some of my published work from this project looks at Fidel Castro on TV. Uh, contrary to many recent assumptions, uh, I argue that in fact, Fidel Castro was the world's first reality TV star um, and that he used television quite novelly, not only to appeal to, but also to help usher in to delineate a revolutionary public, which in the process uh, made the small screen a kind of center for revolutionary governance while also turning citizens into spectators and spectators into citizens in a very consequential way. At the COGIT, I'll be sharing some work on travel bans in the age of the Cuban Revolution. So most of us know, of course, that in the United States, uh, a travel ban to Cuba still remains on the books, infamously, uh, one of the longest lasting such travel bans in our modern history. Um, but in this chapter, I'm also trying to get at the sometimes much more opaque limitations to citizen mobility in revolutionary Cuba. So to think about how travel bans on both sides of the Florida Straits become a standard by which the revolution's achievements and failures could be measured. So for US citizens who travel in defiance of the travel ban, that becomes an act of solidarity and a vehicle of knowledge production. Um, and encouraged in Cuba, ordinary people to see new parts of the island and the world, or uh, in, in, in kind of an opposite sense, turn the waters around the island into a ceiling on their aspirations. So thinking about travel bans both as an impediment to, but also a vehicle for producing knowledge about the revolution. So overall, the subject of revolution features not only your typical subjects, Fidel Castro, of course, gets his own chapter, but also ordinary people on both sides of the Florida Straits in dialogue with new technologies, new experiences, and networks. And the end goal here is really to think about reciprocal effects. I argue that the politicization of everyday life was an inescapable effect of revolutionary process, but also the catalyst for novel ways of knowing and being. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Matthew Marciello and I'm a senior undergraduate double concentrating in American studies and gender and sexuality studies. Broadly speaking, my research lies within queer studies, combining sociocultural history with theory and critique. More specifically, I'm interested in intersex studies, the history of sexuality, LGBTQ plus history in the United States, queer and queer of color theory and critique, trans studies, and black queer studies. As I've gone through Brown, I have found myself increasingly interested in processes such as queering, racialization, medicalization, apologization, 
sociocultural phenomena that have come to structurally define the United States and the world at large. Finding a passion for studying these racialized and queered superstructures has propelled me in a decisively academic direction. I am delighted to say that starting this fall, I will be matriculating as a master's student in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at The Ohio State University. Alongside the master's, I intend on pursuing a graduate minor in African American and African Studies. After my MA, I aim to pursue a PhD in American Studies and remaining within the academic sphere. So what about my thesis? My thesis, which I am completing through American Studies, is titled From Hermaphrodites with Attitude to Hashtag End Intersex Surgery, Intersex Activism, Resistance, and Critique of Intersex Genital Surgery. The inspiration for this thesis project came during my first year at Brown, when I read intersex activist Pigeon Pagonis' article, First Do Harm, in which they detail their traumatic past of intersex surgeries performed by doctors who have, quote, discarded tenets of the Hippocratic Oath. To be clear, when I say intersex, I'm referring to the 1.7% of the population who is not strictly 100% male or female at birth in terms of biological sex. Intersex studies scholars regard biological sex as a socially constructed category of human difference that can be understood as an amalgamation of five and sometimes six components, including genitalia, gonads, internal reproductive organs, hormones, chromosomes, and sometimes also secondary sex characteristics. Many of those whose biological sex does not perfectly fit into the box of male or female are subjected to non-consensual, medically unnecessary, cosmetic and physically and psychologically damaging intersex surgeries and other intersex related medical procedures to normalize them. In my thesis's analysis of United States intersex activist history from the 1990s beginnings of the intersex movement through present day intersex activism that harnesses the power of social media and the hashtag, I explore intersex people, their brilliantly deconstructive critiques of intersex medicalization and their vibrant articulations of intersex identity politics. I demonstrate that despite the harm intersex people have faced at the hands of medical professionals, intersex people through activism have been able to resist and critique the practice of intersex genital surgery and the broader systems of medicalization that sustain these surgeries. I concurrently consider how these systems of medicalization in the case of intersexuality and otherwise are saturated with racial and racialized meaning. Beyond this thesis project, I aim to continue reading, writing, and teaching about marginalized populations, especially the LGBTQIA community. I myself am not intersex, but I am in fact gay, queer, and non-binary. And I hope to draw from my own personal sense of self and my ever-growing sense of academic clout that comes along with earning a BA, then an MA, and then a PhD to fight for the communities that I'm a part of and that I stand in allyship and solidarity with. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Matthew and Jennifer. And it's just wonderful to see um, the energy uh, of those two talks. And I hope everybody has, I wish we could you know, have a genuine applause here. I hope you will send telepathic applause, everybody in the audience. Um, but just the, the combination of intellectual energy, um, you know, precocious erudition, and value commitments in these talks, I just think is amazing. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to, to hear you present your work. Um, I just wanna also thank the audience for joining us and just sharing this hour with us. Um, it's a delight to have you here. Please do visit the events page of our website to see our upcoming programming, which will feature collaborative webinars sponsored by the Black Visualities Initiative special workshops for doctoral students on writing for the public and on using data science in humanities research and a new series beginning in March entitled Democracy, a Humanities Perspective. I also invite you to check out our podcast, Meeting Street, Conversations in the Humanities, where I explore topics of vital societal interest through conversations with scholars and writers whose voices have helped define issues and shape debates. Recent episodes include the history and science of virtual reality and the humanities in the time of COVID-19. Thanks again for attending. Thanks for caring about the humanities. Thanks for being interested in these complex and wonderful topics. 
stay safe and be well.